Good afternoon. Thank you for coming uh, all the way there. This is great. Um, we have a visitor who came from even further. Um, this is uh, Annette O'Connor from Iowa State, uh, an epidemiologist and a veterinarian. <laughs> um, so um, please uh, make her feel welcome and I'll let her take it from here. Uh, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, visit. I'm a visiting guy. We're talking about uh, uh, automation of systematic reviews. Um, and I do systematic reviews outside of the clinical sciences. Um, and so I was going to give a very high overview of uh, uh, systematic reviews and research synthesis outside of the clinical sciences and then discuss some of their projects that we're working on with respect to automation. Um, so uh, just a quick declaration of conflicts of interest. I don't think I have any conflicts relevant to this talk, <laughs> so we can move on from there. Um, Acknowledgement of colleagues who make work happen, all of the projects that I've done almost invariably. I've worked with Dr. Jan Sargent, who's at the University of Guelph, and Dr. Julie Glanfall, who is the information scientist at York Health Economics Consortium. And if you know anything about Cochrane, you'd know her from the information sciences with Cochrane. And, and our group does systematic reviews in animals and food. Uh, so I started off as a veterinarian um, many, many years ago. And um, so I work predominantly in food production. And so uh, systematic reviews are being used increasingly in uh, food production and pretty much any area that has a public health aspect to it. Um, people are interested in the idea of transparent and comprehensive use of evidence and scientific evidence in decisions about their food. Um, so with respect to you know the areas where there's a bit more penetration of systematic reviews are food safety, specifically specifically related to biological hazards. So the salmonella, the E. coli, the campylobacter that are on your um, beef and, and poultry. Um, huge area is the introduction of genetically modified organisms, be they animals or plants, into people's food. Um, people are also interested in their additives and the ev evidence base that makes the additives legal. So, you know, your, your yellows and your browns and all those sorts of things. Toxicology, the use of uh, pesticides and herbicides, either in grains and how they're going to end up both in the environment and, and how they're going to spread and how the, what the impact of those uh, pesticides and herbicides. And then last but not least, uh, just pure good old zoonotic diseases. So uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, otherwise known as mad cow disease, that made a lot of people think about what was happening in their food supply and, uh, and avian influenza, which is not a food safety concern at all. People are just concerned about uh, getting avian influenza from being in the community that lives near uh, poultry facilities. So in these areas, we, uh, the public is increasingly wanting transparent and comprehensive use of research evidence. There's also a lot of money in these areas. And so it's important to realize that there's a different, completely different approach to how things get legal with respect to feed and food. And uh, it all happens within a regulatory framework called a risk assessment. And we're not going to spend much on this, but risk assessment is done at the government level. It's a risk analysis uh, and it's management, communication and risk assessment. And systematic reviews happen down here in the risk assessment section. And what happens is, if you think about in clinical sciences, uh, a group might make a decision, uh, you know, a, a clinician might read about a systematic review about the efficacy of a product and decide potentially with that patient about the, ben the benefits and harms of that product. Maybe there's been a grade guideline used and, and so there's a guideline that's, that happens and usually we think that there might be a sort of a patient discussion that doesn't happen with food. When we regulate something with food, by and large, you don't get to choose whether you have that food. You know, there's, it's made at the regulatory level whether we're going to use yellow 257 and the individual, by and large, doesn't get to choose whether they do or don't take that in. Consequently, at the beginning, when we're assessing the risk associated with putting a product in the food supply, there is an enormous amount of engagement with people and not as much as they might want. but So these three processes are split out. There's risk management 
which is the government folks. There's the risk communicators and all they do is tell you about the risk of your food. So uh, for example, whether pregnant women should eat non-pasteurised milk, uh, drink non-pasteurised milk or eat non-pasteurised cheese because of the potential risk of listeriosis. Whether you should eat salmon if you're pregnant because of the potential for mercury. All those, those messages that you get, they come from risk assessment that is done in food supply. What can go wrong? How can it happen? How likely is it? And what are the consequences? And the regulatory framework that we all use is Codex Alimentarius, and uh, that was published in 2003. And all the countries pretty much use this, this framework for assessing what can go wrong, how can it happen, how likely it is, and the consequences. And the World Health Organization signed on to that approach quite some time ago. So as I said, there are some similarities between the use of systematic reviews in clinical sciences and, and food and feed safety assessment. In particular with respect to the idea that people would do systematic reviews on multiple of outcomes. So you would say, you know, as somebody might do systematic reviews on the potential, you know, how much longer a person is going to survive and they might also do something adverse about how many, what's going to be the decrease in your quality of life if you survive and you take this drug. Um, so there's a balance of benefits and harms, but the really big difference is in risk assessment of food and feed. We have, uh, we use models to assess the risk. And what I mean by, we use systems models. A model that starts at, uh, well everywhere else in the world it's called from farm to fork, but in Australia and New Zealand it's called from paddock to plate. Right, so we, <laughs> We start with, um, for example, uh, there's a big problem, uh, not a big problem, there's a concern at the moment about the amount of arsenic in rice. And so if we were assessing the risk of eating rice, we would start with how much uh, arsenic is in the soil, what genotypes are in the rice, and what is going to happen in the processing, and then how many people are going to eat the rice, and how many servings people eat over a year, so that we could have this whole system of rice consumption to try to figure out what are the risks associated with the detection of ar arsenic in rice. And these models are massive, and they have just multiple places where science could inform right? And stakeholders are really interested in each of those particular places. What's the evidence for a particular soil type? What's the evidence for a particular genotype of rice? What's the evidence for the fact that people, how much rice people eat? So at many, many points you could do a systematic review. And at almost none of those points will you do randomised control trials, right? Many of that information, much of that information is going to come from biomedical research and rat studies on toxicology, etc. Much of it's going to come from observational studies. So it's kind of complicated, takes a long time. And on top of that, people are interested. It used to be that we only modelled uh, animal health, uh, human health, you know, what was the impact on you. Now we model what's the impact on animals, what's the impact on plants. Uh, we model what's the impact on animals' welfare, because I work in meat production, and we model what's the impact on the environment. And so now that we've got this massive model with just this huge number of places where evidence could be included. And stakeholders are very engaged and they're very interested in transparency. And, and when I talk about stakeholders, that's the other thing that's different in food and feed safety. Everybody's a consumer. So in guidelines for clinical health, you're usually just talking about patients. But everybody's a consumer of food. Everybody's deeply involved in what they eat, right? Many people care a lot about what they eat. Um, so consumers and producers are obviously really interested in this model. Trade partners are really interested in this model. And it turns out that citizens, people who don't even eat sometimes, are interested in your product. For example, I am the work in the area of meat production. And a huge number of people are interested in the welfare implications of everything we do for meat production. So the risk assessment now often take into account what is the hazard of poor animal welfare from a change that we might use promoted by a group of people who don't eat meat. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just the, um, the amount of engagement you have with people and who you have to consult 
and people who care about the evidence is getting bigger and bigger. So I said it happens in a lot of areas and really the one that was the huge, the huge driver of risk assessment and systematic reviews in risk assessment is GMOs. So there's been a huge amount of research on GMOs and the question of their safety and their effects on human health had been the subject of many reviews and uh, it didn't matter, it doesn't matter which review you do, nobody, nobody is happy with the, the conclusion. It's pretty much my impression. <laughs> So, um, so, you know, I'm going to give you a couple of classic examples of, of risk assessment and, and why systematic reviews are in there. Um, the GMO one, so of course there's the issue of, you know, the, a question that you might not be aware of, what's the fate of GMOs, right? How do they disintegrate? So if you have GMO corn, and uh, I come from Iowa, there's a lot of corn. If you have GMO corn and it rots in the, you, you can harvest the corn, but you still have the whole plant there. What is the fate of that once you plough that into the soil? What happens to those genes? What happens to those genes if you feed them to beef and cattle? Um, what's the impact on other species? Clearly the entomologists are interested in the impact on arthropods, as we should all be, because we would be, you know, uh, if we lose the bees, we'll be in all sorts of trouble, right? And of course there's the obvious one, which is the impact on human health. But really, um, it, they really spread out. Ah, oh, you can't see that, it's a shame. Uh, this is the arsenic and rice example that I told you about. Uh, about five years ago, 2010, 2012, FDA took 1,200 samples of rice products. Uh, this is, and it turns out that, you know, we'd all been told to eat uh, brown rice because it was going to make us healthier, and which rice product has the most arsenic in it? Brown rice, right? You know, so it's got like three times as much brown arsenic in it as everybody else. And so the question, the other thing that's problematic with rice is there's a, people are concerned about gluten-free products. And so there's a movement away from giving uh, wheat-based products or gluten-based products to children, right? But that means there's a movement towards rice-based product and rice products have arsenic in them. So um, this was of course a risk assessment question. and. Now you're going to do a risk assessment on the consumption of rice. You've got to find out uh, which countries grow the rice with the highest arsenic con uh, con consumption, which rice products have the, highest rice co have the highest content, and that actually turns out to be brown rice. Which populations are going to eat the most servings of rice? Who's going to eat it? Infants, people of Asian descent, people, you know, new, new markets for rice consumption. There's a lot more rice being eaten because people are concerned about gluten-free. Um, and then you've got to line up the comparative benefit of the fibre versus the arsenic, right? So these questions become very complicated. And last month, I, by the way, there's a really gory picture coming up, so heads up. I'm used to talking to vets and so they don't mind gory pictures, but this one, it's not this one, but it's coming up. Just to show you the extent of where we use systematic reviews, meat inspection is something that you're all probably unfamiliar with. But you might be familiar if you do eat meat that there's usually this stamp on your meat that says, particularly if you eat lamb, roast leg of lamb, it says this product is safe. The way meat's inspected by and large is people look at it and palpate it um, and they uh, to say that it's safe. And the thing is that that's based on a system when we had brucellosis, tuberculosis and hydatids and we haven't had them for a really long time. And so it's an incredibly inefficient approach to, a set, to proving that a product is safe. So, you know, some people really wanted to modernise the meat inspection system. So there you go, that's a gory picture of tuberculosis. But when we wanted to do that, the number of reviews that were required, we needed a review of what diseases you can actually detect based on observation, what you can't, which turns out to be Salmonella, <coughs> E. coli, Campylobacter, every organism. What's the prevalence of those diseases? I was involved in this in Europe. And so the prevalence of, uh, you know, tuberculosis is completely different in the UK versus Romania. Well, not that the UK is in Europe anymore, but it <laughs> <laughs> the prevalence of it in Germany and France is enormously different to, to it be what it is in Romania and Bulgaria, right? Uh, and then you've got to do a review on the sensitivity and specificity of these methods, how effective current interventions are, because we do a huge number of things to a huge number of products to make them safe. So all of these questions, stakeholders want to know where did you get the evidence from? And it, uh, it, there's plenty of work for systematic reviewers in feed and food. 
right? There's also plenty of work for improving the approach to research synthesis in feed and food. Currently, we've modified most of the approaches um, from Cochrane, but Cochrane's really focused on comparative efficacy and RCTs, right? And most of our questions are not about comparative efficacy and RCTs. We are interested in the characteristics of, of things, so PO questions if you're into systematic reviews, such as the fate of toxins. We're interested in disease causation, and so we're using observational studies. Um, much of our literature is not in PubMed and Embase, right? It's in private databases such as CABI and Well Agricola. And also the risk of bias tools that are currently being used, um, they don't really apply or they apply poorly. So, you know, there's a community of research synthesizers outside of the clinical health who are trying to use these tools um, and improve these tools so that they better meet our situation. And the thing about it is that everybody eats. Right? So there's a really huge market <laughs> for systematic reviews in feed and food. The other really big area is environmental health. Right? So there's a huge uh, number of questions about where risk assessment is also used. So risk assessment in environmental health is enormous. So I just want to give you an example of a review that we've done that doesn't fall into the clinical health paradigm. So we have this all the time. This is a question I've done over a review question I've done over a number of years. It's looking at the impact of living near a confined animal feeding operation, otherwise known as a factory farm, which is not my favorite term because I come from agriculture, on the impact of the community members who live near that. Um, so this is a hugely important era, er, issue. And what that is, is that's a picture of four hog barns right beside each other. Each hog barn probably holds about a thousand pigs, right? So this person's living next to four, somebody is living next to 4,000 pigs. 4,000 pigs is pretty smelly, right? So uh, it has impacts on uh, mental health, uh, you know, that, that's a concern. But the question is, is, does it have impact on actual physical health, right? So uh, this, is, um, this is a hugely hot political issue in Iowa. If you look at that, that's Iowa and that's the 99 counties in Iowa, and every purple dot is a swine farm that has over a thousand animals in it, right? Every blue dot is a cattle farm that has over a thousand animals, and the green dots have more. So we have a lot of animals in Iowa. The American Association for Public Health came out in 19... I don't know when actually, about 20... No, it was 2000 something, about 10 years ago, and said we should have a moratorium and no more swine facilities because of the public health impact. Um, and that was, of course, a fairly major problem because people are, again, deeply involved in, in their concern for their health. So we were asked to do this review. And um, the interesting thing about this review is that it turns out there's actually only 10 populations that have been studied. They're in 16 papers, but they've only been 10 studied. One of them is in North Carolina, which is interesting from the point of view that North Carolina in the US, if you don't know, is potentially economically depressed. And we don't put CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, in industrialized areas. We put it in economically, they tend to be in North Carolina to be in economically depressed areas. So there's a huge social justice and environmental justice issue associated with living next to a hog farm. So one farm is from North Carolina. There's none in Iowa. Interestingly enough, there's never been a not very many studies done that are good quality. Then the other studies come from the Netherlands and Denmark and Germany because there's really high pig populations there. So, you know, this is important from an assessing the risk of bias point of view. This is not going to be a question that's a randomized control trial, right? And it's hugely confounded if you're an epidemiologist. I'm not sure how many epidemiologists are in the room. <laughs> I don't think it's very many. Interestingly though, the one study, one of the problems we run into is multiple testing. So somebody just getting the same data and testing it over again. This one study that has about 101 people in it, it was done in 2003. Uh, they have, the authors have, uh, they did a great job when they first did the study. They measured about 300 plus health outcomes and over the years, they published it in 2005, 2007, 2009, 2012, and the last one was in 2013. But it's the same group of 101 people who they studied in 2003. 
So from an evidence point of view, a lot has changed in the swine industry. So how useful that is to now is problematic because they've had some major diseases in swine industry and we've changed how we organize, we organize swine. The other example of, if you're an epidemiologist, you might recognize this is the absolute classic example of a biased approach to enrolling people in a study. So I'm just gonna read it to you. So they were studying the effect of living near a swine operation on your health. And so this is who they chose to enroll. The first group of people was a snowball sample. That means they just kept asking until they found them all. Of respondents who lived near industrial hog farms and had been identified by local grassroots activists as individuals who were distressed by the effects of living near a hog farm, right? <laughs> So, you know, most of us would think that there's a potential for bias there. You, know, you ask people who hate hog farms how much they hate hog farms. Um, and so this is problematic if you're making a policy about this because this is the only evidence that you have and, and you're potentially concerned that it's very biased. So, you know, we, we have a lot of tools that we use, but we really have to modify most of the things that happen in Cochrane because they just don't fit what we're after. We've done a lot of reviews over the years. We've done things like carcass washes on salmonella. Uh, for salmonella, we wash carcasses to remove salmonella. We've done testing of dogs for leishmania coming from Europe, uh, coming to Europe from the Middle East. So there's a huge movement at the moment to go to the Middle East and find dogs that have been abandoned test them for rabies and then ship them to Europe, North America, Europe or North America so they can be adopted out. In fact, the person who rented me my car as I left was literally going next week to find 30 dogs in Turkey, test them for rabies and ship them to Australia and uh, ship them to the US and adopt them out. The only problem is that there are a lot of other diseases that dogs can bring with them other than rabies, in particular leishmania, which is a nasty disease which you don't want. So we did a review on what is the risk of this and how are we going to screen it. Um, vaccines for salmonella and, and E. coli. We've also done some reviews that are kind of different. Uh, we did a review on what's the, uh, how high purchase should be for hens. You know, so how do you make a hen happy? That was an interesting one. <laughs> um, so you have, to, you, know, you have to assess whether a hen's happy. Um, and that's quite an interesting approach. And there are some really good ways to measure welfare in hens. So it's, it's interesting to work in animal welfare. I, I was once at a talk where somebody talked about uh, joyful cattle and joyful pigs. And um, I was really perplexed at how one would assess whether a pig was joyful. Um, <laughs> but in the same talk, in the same conference, somebody discussed that they had a horse that was persnickety. And I was like, that's a really complex emotion for a horse. <laughs> so, it's interesting working in, in, uh, in animals, and actually I should point out that I, I work in all areas that animals are used. Uh, I work in uh, food uses of animals, I work in companion, companionship uses of animals, and I also work in biomedical uses of animals. So if somebody does uses of animals, uh, I'll do a review on it. So how am I going for time? Cool. Yeah, that's perfect. So that just gives you an overview of, uh, you know, the, if there's a, there's a lot of work to automate systematic reviews and make systematic reviews work outside of the clinical sciences. Um, and like I said, everybody eats, so, and risk assessments are big, so there's a market there. I just want to talk you, to you about some of the current projects we have um, that we have going. I'm just going to talk about three of them. We have a couple of others, but these are probably the most interest to a health informatics group. So, one of the projects we're interested in is, of course, living systematic reviews. So we're interested in uh, automation of systematic reviews. But this particular topic that I've already mentioned, this association between living near an animal operation and community health, we originally did that in 2010. And the literature just keeps coming out. So we were asked to redo it again in 2013. And so we published a protocol and we did the review and literally the you know every every three months a new study kept coming out that we had to update this review and update this review 
um, which is really frustrating because you just want to get it published but the minute you know it's, pub it's published it's going to be out of date, right? And certainly the people who funded it are not happy as well either, right? They don't want to have to come back every five years and pay us to do it. So um, our idea at the moment is to have, uh, uh, to allow the stakeholder to have the review but also to have a continuous update of the data, uh, to allow stakeholders to see the data for themselves um, and also um, uh, we get, I get contacted a lot by um, county agents, etc., who people who want to protest about having a CAFO and they'd like to have uh, ex access to our data. What we have at the moment is that we're using uh, Shiny, which is an app in R. Does anyone know that? Yeah, so we've just linked our data up to a Shiny app so that we're trying to have people have access to the data so that they can, if it's going to work, let's see. Ah. So, so that they can go through and select the data that they want. What it has is all of the different sort of health outcomes that we've extracted data on. And then you can go through and select all the different ways that uh, researchers measure whether you're exposed to livestock. So some people might measure how far you are from a livestock. Some people measure uh, how much ammonia there is on average near you and your farm. Some people measure how much it smells. So there's just a huge number of ways that people measure if you're near a farm. So you can sort of select those. So this is an example of the data that's available on upper respiratory disease. Given that the researchers were looking at distance, so how far you were from the farm and uh, so you can see here that uh, there's uh, three, uh, two studies here who both the outcome, the outcome was allergic rhinitis and they've got a measure here of how far you are from the farm. And what we've done is just extracted the odds ratio, uh, plotted that and then over here we've given our assessment of the risk of bias. And of course, that's hugely contentious, the risk of bias. People, um, you know, why do you think this study that I like is biased? right, because um, that can be potentially problematic. And so if this works, we also have this link that um, gives all our classifications of the risk of bias. So what we're trying to do is have this system working and up to date, but what we'd really like to do is link it to um, new, new data so that I don't have to keep going and, and c conducting my CAVI search every year. So we're really working on that living systematic review aspect and we would like to be able to have that up and going even if it's not going to be perfect we just like to have something that is better the other thing that we're working on is dynamic updating so people who use R are you there would be people who are familiar with uh, NIDA and dynamic uh, reporting so uh, the guy this guy here was at Iowa State he did his uh, uh, PhD at Iowa State before he went to work at our studio and he was the one who wrote R NIDA so we were kind of lucky on on having that and I'm going to give you the example of how this works but I'm going to use an, a more obscure example of a review another review I've done uh, it was a review on which antibiotic to use for testing uh, to for treating bovine respiratory disease there happened to be 17 different antibiotics on the market and so we did what's called a mixed treatment comparison meta-analysis it was a kind of nice one but we did it in 2010 and the same story, we had to update it. But we, when, we, when we went to update it, it was a real pain because you've got to go back into Word and you've got to redo all the tables. And we decided that from then on, we would write all our reviews in NIDA and Markdown files um, because backfitting Word into that was a real pain. So from now, all our files are written in, in NIDA and Markdown. And so then we're trying to link, what we want is to have this dynamic document that gives you the report combined with a shiny, combined preferably with somebody's automatic search. <laughs> so just to give a feel for you, who, for those of you who haven't used it, the beauty of NIDA is that it embeds the code in your actual manuscript. And so somebody from a transparency point of view, someone can actually come and see your code and how you've written it, which is lovely. Um, but then if you want to update your data set, so I'm just going to give you an example. So this is a figure from our paper and this is the network of all the antibiotics that are used for bovine respiratory disease um, up the top there. So these are all the arms from all the trials. There's 196 arms. 
and you can see that by far the biggest is placebo. But down here, this is ceftiaferpina, which is one of the drugs we use. And we had a, once you do, you've got this document set up. Say for example, you wanted to add another line of data, but somewhere in your document, it says I have 196 trials, but you add one. So you want it to say, I have 197. Well, it'll, you can set it up so it'll automatically link and change that, which is a, just a thing of beauty. Instead of having to go back to your Word document. Um, so just to give you an example, so here I just added, you know, some lines of data and I've got more trials of safety of fair pinner and you basically press compile and it updates it and you go, well, that's going to happen already. But in truth, it doesn't usually, the analysis is updated, but your manuscript is not updated, but in Nitter it is, right? So that's lovely. And it updates in a mixed treatment comparison meta-analysis where you have all this output, it just updates it automatically. Beautiful. Last but not least, um, we also have a project on linguistic classifiers. Um, so we have a team who knew that there were a group of people, linguists, who had spent the last 10 years analyzing the science of STEM language and how STEM scientists write. So we have some applied linguists, uh, these two people here, um, and we also have some computational linguists, which are these two people here. And so our group has applied linguists, computational linguists, it has two human computer interaction uh, folks and a uh, statistician slash uh, computational scientist and me, right? And what they're trying to do is solve this problem for me. <laughs> so we all know reviews are time consuming and currently there are many groups working from what I can tell on text-based classifiers, right? Using n-grams or whatever. So, you know, they're going to read your paper and sort of classify it using n-grams and random forests, etc. Our group is focused on assessing if linguistic analysis can increase the sensitivity of text, text identification. So reading the literature and actually somebody had written a systematic review on it, which is always handy. You know, these algorithms, from what I can tell, seem to max out at like, I don't know, 85, 95. And, you know, like there's still always a group of studies that are misclassified and that's problematic from a systematic review point of view. So what we're interested in is can we use a different rule-based approach to finding the ones that don't get classified properly and find out what sort of language they have and use a new classifier. And the test base we're using is study design. And we, the reason we're using study design because it's a fact, right? We didn't want to do risk of bias because risk of bias is a judgment. Study design is technically a fact about the study, so we should be able to extract that information. Um, so outside of the clinical sciences, of course, randomized controlled trials are not common. Um, so in experimental sciences, you've got parallel, blocked, factorial, split plot, Latin square sort of designs. Same with observational studies. And the risk of bias assessment is dependent upon the study design. And it takes a really high level of expertise to know what the study design is, right? So, you know, in a biomedical experiment, if somebody doesn't recognize that they've used a split plot design, then they won't realize that they haven't got the variant, the sum of squares correctly in the ANOVA, which means that their numbers are wrong. So it it's really important that people get their study design right. Well, it turns out that I don't personally feel that biomedical researchers are awesome at recognizing their study design. And I'm really confident that epidemiologists often don't know their observational study design as well. So they might call it a case control study and it's not. And in biomedical sciences, I think that they just don't stay their study design because they really don't know what their design is. And, you know, good on them for that. <laughs> so the aim is to have sort of a machine augmented design system, right? So uh, the context for this, the, the sort of test case, is we're interested in the question of the association between colon cancer and dietary fat, right? So this is one of my biomedical ones. And what we're doing is reviewing, reviewing the experimental models of dietary cancer, right? So there's lots of aspects of this we wanted to automate, but this is just now about the automation of study design. So if you look here, if you look at the first one, and I don't know how great you, are, you guys are in your study design, but it, the first one's a bit of a giveaway because the, the investigator said it's a two by two factorial design. 
and then they said there's two treatments and two radiation exposures. So they got their design right, which was nice, but there are examples where they don't. So this sentence, this first sentence, is actually quite readily classified by most of the classifiers that we've tried, right? And we usually get it right. But interestingly, the, the next two sentences, so the first one, so the wild type mice and the whatever those things are mice, were fed either an FC diet or an FF diet, that, that sentence defies classification. Doesn't matter how many times we run that through a classifier and different types of classifiers, it just doesn't seem to be able to pick up and classify it correctly. Um, and our classifier says, is it a parallel design, a crossed design, and a crossed is either a blocked or factorial, or is it something else? And that sentence is apparently defies classification. And the next one, mice administered the DS or the plain drinking water concurrently with the control or the 10% BRB incorporated diet. Again, most of us would look at that and go, well, that's a factorial design, but it defies classification in, in our models. For some reason, we, we don't really. So what we're trying to do is we have identified these series of sentences that defy classification, but we're quite confident what they are. And our applied linguists are conducting a lexicogrammatical analysis to figure out why it is that I'm quite confident those last two are factorial. I have to say that I can't tell a verb from a noun, and um, I actually have no idea how they are doing the lexicogrammatical analysis. They gave me some slides. I still don't understand it, <laughs> but I have faith in them. Um, and so they're doing that analysis. Um, and then we're going to conduct a, a POS, which I've learned is a parts of speech analysis, to develop that rule-based classifier. And that's kind of where we're at, we, we are at the moment. Um, we're looking at then, you know, once we have that, we of course would like to expand to multiple designs, right? But uh, we'll just take it easy at the moment and have a small, simple data set and see if we can find these rules. And then, of course, you know, we don't have to stick with designs. We would like to know if when some aspects of language defy simple classification, and I don't mean to mean that n-grams, et cetera, are simple, can we use a more nuanced approach to understanding the language of how scientists write to analyze, to, to try to automatically recognize the design or some other aspect? And so that's kind of what we're interested in. We don't think it's going to be for everything, it's just for those one parts that, that don't work well. And then we have to find out whether the way biomedical researchers write about a factorial design is the way that human researchers write about it in randomized control trials. So there's issues of generalizability that we're currently addressing this summer. That is the whole schema of, of, of that approach, but I, we're not going to go into that. I think we're pretty close to time. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions or, or, or we can finish and I just left you a nice picture of a nice fluffy cow. So it's like, in my defense, it's not a cow, it's definitely a bull, okay? <laughs> I should know that. So it's nice and fluffy because it's going to be sold and so somebody's washed it and hair dried it and as you can see, so they've done the... Because <laughs> it's winter, so it's nice and cold, so it's got a really long coat, it's kind of cool. <laughs> So thanks very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions and I appreciate your attentiveness. Thank you. I, I actually, I don't know whether that's, I mean, I agree with you. If I read a paper, I absolutely know where to go to find the study design. It's in the figures, especially in biomedical research. I can definitely tell from a figure, it's got plus, 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 minus, <laughs> minus, plus, and negative, negative. I know that that was a factorial design, um, and it's of interest to us. And we, but we haven't we haven't got there yet. So I think at the moment there's a huge number of ways that we can improve um, identification of study design. I suppose for us we're not uh, study design is a text, test case for can we use linguistic analysis to to better classify things. In truth, I have to tell us that the. the my, the, the linguists, what they actually started developing was, what they started out was a student runs their paper through their, a, a tool that finds all the parts of a paper and writes back and, said, and, and analyzes it and writes back and says, hey, you know, for your discipline, and they did 30 different disciplines, you haven't 
use the same sort of language as your discipline does to describe the rationale. Right? So it actually started off as a writing tutor, particularly focused on people with English as a second language. Um, and so they still sort of, it's a, but I don't disagree with you at all. I personally would like to see their tool used to improve comprehensive reporting. So that's another tool. I'd have to say it gets really complex. So if somebody does a factorial design and then the analysis does a interaction term and a main effects and then decides that the interaction is not significant and then only presents the main effects, it gets really hard to interpret. It'd be much better if they just put it in a sentence. Yeah. <laughs> or we just all stop writing papers and just present the data, that would be nice. That would. Yeah. <laughs> Can't disagree with that. <laughs> Yeah, they're so overla overlapping, the era of improved reporting and extracting. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, this is a problem with living systematic reviews. Um, and, and where do we, what do we do? So um, I don't think this has been worked out yet, what we should do. Our thought process was that, like this, that we agree that to make the conclusion you need a panel of group uh, who sat together and kumbaya about what, should, what inference should we take from this. And that would be published, right? And, and that group is not going to get together every time there is a new uh, paper. However, for us, what we'd like to be able to do is accumulate the data over time, right? And, and continue to update the, the literature and the figures, etc so that and have that on a website but indicate that the you know the conclusion that we have is based on this amount of data and here's the new data and at some stage we'd have to come back and somebody's going to have to pay to bring a panel together and say has it changed it it's still going to be expensive um, to do that but it, the idea of starting from scratch you know going out and doing the search and anything i find that more laborious. I think I'd just rather do it every three months and then after we've accumulated, I don't know, 10 more papers, then we could have a phone call and say, do you think we need to get together? And everybody could look at it. So I agree, it, you can't change the conclusion, um, but end users would like, I think, to know the latest data. Because the alternative is they're looking at a paper that's five years old, right? And they could at least come and see, hey, there's been no new studies. Or actually, you know, it turns out, by the way, don't live near goats, right? Uh, if you're heads up on that one. Uh, don't, live, uh, don't live near more than 25,000 goats within 500 metres of you. That's not really good for your health. You're going to get Q fever, right? But you're in Australia, so you get, you've, got, you've got access to a vaccine. So it's okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that turned out that was kind of interesting. When we're using, so there's a couple of problems with the observational studies, different studies designs and the inference from them. Uh, let me see. Um, with respect to the calculate, using meta-analysis to calculate a summary effect that describes the effect of exposure, right? Um, we actually haven't done that in this review. We have built a forest plot that describes the data right but there's no summary effect measure because of exactly what you say um, you know it, it's it's okay to compare apples to oranges if the question's about fruit right <laughs> but this one is really extreme and so that's why the conclusion that the other that you were talking about this conclusion is based on the evidence but it's not based on a summary effect measure. It's looking at all that evidence and those individual effects. And um, I think there are times when you can use an observational study to get a summary number. And in risk assessment, we certainly do. For example, if I want to know the prevalence of salmonella in pigs, that is an observational study. And if I've got 20 of them, I'm going to calculate a summary effect measure and I'm going to put it into my risk analysis and those 95% uh, confidence intervals or credible intervals are going to be in my risk assessment. This one, on the other hand, no. I mean, I think it's really topic specific how you approach observational studies. Um, it's similarly, it's topic specific how you approach biomedical research and how 
those estimates of toxicology in, in rats um, are going to be used in your risk assessment. So got to have, like in clinical health, you have to have really knowledgeable experts um, and you can do a lot of damage <laughs> by doing a meta-analysis. Especially, you know, if somebody's combined, I, I would say the classic is somebody combines a nested case control study, which is actually an estimate of the risk ratio with a true survivor-based uh, case control study, which is actually an estimate of the odds ratio, puts them in the same meta-analysis and it's like, well, one's actually a risk ratio and one's an odds ratio, but without a knowledge of your study design, I think very many people would not know that that shouldn't be done, in my opinion. Uh, it's very difficult, incredibly difficult. So uh, to start with, there's absolutely no obligation for, if I was looking at the efficacy of an intervention like vaccination, uh, these, are these are private companies and there's absolutely no obligation that a company has to tell me, that, give me the IPPD, right? Um, the other issue is that, um, say it was studies on salmonella prevalence in, in swine, most of those are done by academics and academics are really hopeless at keeping data, right? Most of the data sets have left with their grad student's computer on an Excel spreadsheet, right? So they might really like to give them to you, but they have no clue. Um, in, in food and agriculture, um, we are... 10, 15 years behind you with respect to open data. But the great thing is that you guys are going to invent the wheel and we'll just, you know, we'll catch up quickly. We're pretty good, we're pretty good parasites, right? We're <laughs> it's the great thing about being in food and agriculture, you don't have to think of a new idea, you just see what the people in clinical health do and copy it. It's fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, no, no IPD. to say that at the moment what we did was in the preliminary what we did was we ran through the classifiers and we found the ones that it got wrong and we've analyzed them and then so we're looking at what we're trying to find is those patterns and then once we have those patterns then we have to find we're in the process of developing a completely different data set that we haven't studied yet right and we're going to so we have to a do a study set that's on rats and colon cancer, and then we have to do ferrets and infectious diseases, right? So that'll be developed. And we're in the process of making that annotated data set, and it hasn't, but we have to get this rule-based classifier yet. I don't think you could do the rule-based classifier. I mean, you've got to start somewhere. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate your attention. Yeah. It was very nice. Yeah.